Um, I'm here to give a brief overview essentially on um, what our group has been doing yeah, in the last few years, maybe the last few months as well. So this is a picture of us at the moment. So there's Caroline and Stefan who is also here and will speak after my talk and uh, Thomas and, and Albert. Uh, also Andy um, contributed a lot over the last few years and was part of our group. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? So certainly we, we have a lot of topics that we work on. For example, quantum thermodynamics, philosophy of physics, and several other topics that I'm not going to talk about today. But since it's about relativistic quantum information, um, I'll talk about these topics here. So the first part will really to just say very briefly um, what we've been doing in the context of quantum reference frames. Now this will be very brief, so most of you know what this is and you've already heard a talk by Chaslav and several other people about this. So really keep this in the like as a kind of a teaser. So just an overview, what have we looked at, what might be interesting questions perhaps also to tackle in the future. Um, the second part, okay, the first part is maybe like over the last two or three years mostly. Uh, the, third, the second part motivates a bit the research program that if we've been pursuing, which is to, to understand the relation between quantum theory as an abstract Hilbert space theory of probabilities and space-time and how the two interact. Uh, the second part is actually older already, it's nine years old, so I apologize to those of you who've already heard it. But I think it's a nice thought experiment that somewhat motivates the research. Uh, the third part, however, is pretty young. It's minus one month young. <laughs> so it will, be appear, it will appear in the archive towards the end of the month. Um, so everybody who wants to now steal the results I'm talking about, you have like three weeks to write it up <laughs> and submit. <laughs> okay, yeah, so it will be about spin-bounded correlation and something that we might call metrological games somehow. Um, but you'll see what I'm talking about. So quantum reference frames. Um, here's a picture that most of you have seen. This is by one of the um, first papers on this topic by Flaminia, Esteban, and Chaslav, where you say, uh, in, in a very simple um, experiment here, or thought experiment, say you have three particles and you have translation invariance, and you can choose your coordinate system as you wish, then maybe what you want to do is you say, oh, I start with a state like the above, and I do a quantum reference frame transformation and I go to the state below. Yeah. So above you would say, well, there's an origin of my coordinate system and particle C happens to sit at the origin. Particle A is a superposition of two positions. Particle B is like a wave packet sitting further away. Perhaps it's something like, no, it doesn't react. Let's see. Okay. Here you go. So maybe it's a state like the above, right? So, and then you say, what if I jump into the perspective of particle A? So you move your coordinate system so that particle A arrives at the origin. The idea is you do this branch by branch uh, in a coherent way. So the end up is like a, a big a superposition state where A factors out, A becomes the zero. But now depending on whether A was to the left or to the right, whether it's this or that branch, you'll have the C, A, the C, B arrangement like collectively be to the left or being to the right. So you end up with a state that's an entangled state between C and B. Yeah. Whereas previously it was a, a product state. Now, suppose, however, that you believe that physics is invariant in some sense under quantum reference frame transformations. So all the essential things you describe in one frame um, remain in the other frame. And also think, for example, that this particle B is really very far away. Perhaps it has been prepared in another galaxy or so, like really independently from C and A. Um, then how then yeah, can, can it be that this is reference frame dependent? In other words, how can the question of whether B is in a product state with AC be quantum reference frame dependent? So has it been independently prepared or not? How do you understand this? Um, in other words, this asks somehow for the interplay of the compositional structure and uh, the quantum reference frame symmetries that you believe that you have. So we've addressed this in a, in a paper here. Um, that's with Marius Krum also who was in, in our group and um, Philipp Hoen. Um, so basically we ask, you know, um, how do we compose systems in, if we bring in an independent system in a way that is reference frame and quantum reference frame independent, right? It's basically the tensor product rule is not the right thing anymore. You need to talk about what observables are accessible to which observer, right? 
Um, the dual question is like not what you bring in a system, but if you trace out a system. Right? So you say if I forget the third particle, for example, this one doesn't work really anymore. Okay. So if I forget the third particle and I think of tracing it out, then this phase theta that you see on top here, yeah, you would get here you would think that um, if you have only access to system A and perhaps system C, then you can measure the theta. But here it seems like if you have access to A and C only, then you cannot measure theta because the partial trace will kill it. And this is a paradox that has first been raised in a, an apparent paradox in this paper by Angelo, Popescu, Bruna, and, and co-authors. And what we do is we essentially analyze this, this question. We, we give an answer to that question. The answer is basically you have to operationalize what you mean by bringing in another particle. You have to replace the tensor product by saying how you embed fewer into more particles, how the algebras are embedded. And if you do it in, let's say, most symmetric way, the most symmetric choice gives you what we call the relational trace. It's like a replacement of the partial trace. And if you apply it, you will see that, indeed, you still have access to the phase theta on the first two particles, if you forget the third particle. Right. Now, to do so, I should say that um, what we did is, like, usually think of the real line as a continuous line, where you have a continuous transformation group acting. We found it convenient to just model it in a discrete way. So you discretize the line and glue it together. This gives you a finite dimensional Hilbert space, and then you can work out everything explicitly in finite dimensions their position and momentum eigenstates, and you can just work it out all out explicitly with quantum information tools. And so this is also described in this other paper that we've written there. Um, yeah, this is very interesting for you, you start that, you want to read up something new and don't want to bother with technicalities, and this might be perhaps nice to look at. Um, right, so in addition to this way of describing quantum reference frames, there's kind of a, a dual, diff a different way of talking about quantum reference frames which is sometimes called the perspective neutral framework. Again, several people have been involved in this. Um, Philip Hoen was the main proponent of this. The idea is essentially, uh, it's a bit like the page Wutters mechanism. So you start with a globally symmetric quantum state subject to a constraint, and then you can jump into the different perspectives of, of the different subsystems. And what we did, and this is now also in collaboration with Anne-Catherine de la Met, uh, from Chaslav's group was also here. We generalized this approach to basically arbitrary groups, unimodular groups, and analyzed it a bit further. Right. Um, also, this is, I think, kind of can have a nice picture here. Um, so th this is something we looked at, um, again, with, with Ann-Kathrin, and now Stefan is also um, on this paper, where we ask, what, what actually is a good or a bad quantum reference frame? And think of for concreteness, so, so what some of you may know is the page Wutters mechanism. In the page Wutters mechanism, you say you have a system S and you have a reference. The reference is typically thought of as a clock, so a system and a clock. And you say, like, I have a global state, and this global state is time translation invariant. So it's annihilated by the total Hamiltonian. So nothing moves, it's frozen in time, <laughs> that's the idea. But now if you measure the clock system and you find some time t, then you get a conditional state on your system that does depend on the time and still satisfies actually the Schrödinger equation. Now if you look at this construction, you will not only see that this global state this, uh, is, is time translation invariant, but certainly when you look at what it looks like, then it's very massively entangled. And so you'd guess that it's this entanglement somehow that correlates the clock and the system and that is responsible for the kind of time translation asymmetry that you get after you measured the clock. And what we did was to make this rigorous and quantitative, and not only for time translations, but for arbitrary groups. So it turns out that somehow the, the more entangled the global state is, your global invariant state, the more asymmetric is the conditional state on your system. So think of this picture here. You have a global state on RS that's entangled, if it's very strongly entangled and you measure the reference, you look at the conditional state of the system, then the resulting state will be very asymmetric. So if your symmetry is the rotations around the circle, then this will be very much different from its rotated version. But if you don't have that much entanglement, then you have a stronger overlap between the state and its translated version. Right? So this gives the idea that somehow entanglement 
time comes from entanglement, a kind of quantitative version that you formulate here in terms of the Rayney 2 entanglement entropy versus some sort of asymmetry measure that we have. Okay, um, should probably go on a bit. Um, right, so you can do a couple more things here. Average over the Hilbert space to get a quantity that tells you how good is your reference frame actually in a state independent way and a couple of other things that we've, that we've looked at here. Good, now, um, the other topic that we've been interested in is the relation between space-time and quantum theory. And here is a thought experiment um, that some of you have already seen, I'm sure, that has to do with the relativity of simultaneity and the quantum bit. So in a quantum bit, we typically think of like the, the qubit Bloch ball. That's the quantum bit in standard complex quantum theory. But it, nature wouldn't, wouldn't have to be that way. So there is even work by Jordan von Neumann and Wigner on generalizations of the quantum formalism, where they essentially say, well, you could have different sorts of operator algebras, which describe physics, needn't be the complex matrices, but it could be um, operator algebras that give you bits that look differently. For example, your bit could be a classical bit, um, and the, the quantum, the qubit Bloch ball is a three ball, but the, the classical bit would be something like a one-dimensional ball, uh, we have like zero and one and all the statistical mixtures. If you had quantum theory over the real numbers, you would basically get only the equatorial plane of the qubit, which is a circle. But you could have higher dimensional balls that describe bits. Um, if you think of quantum theory over the quaternions, which you can write down and hypothesize what that would work like in physics, you would get a five ball, five dimensional ball, for example. Now, right, so q trit, for example, in contrast, would not be a ball, but some more, more complex shape of, of density matrices. Now the idea is like why, why do we have dimension three, right? So certainly you can ask because we have complex quantum theory, right? Um, but maybe there's a more principled approach and so you can ask maybe space-time has also something to do with the three-dimensionality of the Bloch ball. And here is one thought experiment where you can make that somewhat rigorous, which is with Andy Garner and then Oscar Dalston a couple of years ago already. So you think of a, a Mach 10, the interferometer, where you think of a particle that can travel either lower or the upper branch. And um, the, the which path information, where it sits, is described by a bit. It's a binary alternative for the state space it looks like a Bloch sphere. Uh, so if it's the North Pole state of the Bloch sphere, that would mean that the particle is definitely in the upper branch. South Pole state would mean it's definitely in the lower branch. Um, if it's a state somewhere on the equator, then you would say, well, it's like 50-50. So if you measure, you would find 50-50 probability of being up or down. Yeah, if this is a standard qubit, this, you can all check that this is the case. But it works for d-dimensional Bloch balls as well. Yeah. So in general, you would say the probability of finding the particle in the upper branch has to do with this set coordinate here. It must be linear in this coordinate, so it's something like 1 half z plus 1. Yeah. Now you can ask, well, what if I have Alice and Bob now? So two physicists that sit here close to the arms, and they can do something. So maybe they can insert a little piece of glass or something to the arms. What's it that they can do? Um, assume they're interested only in stuff that's reversible, so that doesn't lead to information loss. Well, in a way, it's quite clear that this must be a transformation that takes your state and maps it to another state, and you can undo it, so it must rotate the Bloch ball somehow. Uh, and it also cannot move the particle from here to there. Since it's done locally in one of the arms, it must preserve the, up, the probability that the particle sits here. It's like no signaling. But this means that it must preserve the z-axis of your Bloch ball, uh, because that's what the probability is, essentially. Bob can do the same on the other branch, right? Same constraints of what that does to the Bloch ball. And well, in the most general case, you would say there are no other constraints. All rotations that preserve this axis, and this is like all the rotations in dimension d minus one. You lose one dimension because you fix this axis. Good. Now you enter your favorite spaceship and fly by, right? And look at the setup. And then you say, oh, interesting. Um, this is a scenario where first Alice chooses her transformation and then does Bob. But then your friend flies by in a spaceship and certainly sees these space-like separated events to happen in the other order. So Bob does first his transformation and then Alice. 
And for that, to not change the physics means not changing the outcome probabilities of your final detector clicks, which means that these transformations must commute, whatever they do. So for all transformations in SOD minus 1. Now we all know that rotations commute in the plane in two dimensions, but not in higher dimensions. So in order to have that, you need to have that the dimension of the block ball is at most 3. And indeed it is 3, as we think we have from our standard description. Um, now you can tweak it a little bit. You can say, well, so far essentially what I assumed is that everything that Alice can do, Bob can also do. In particular, whatever Alice can do, Bob can undo that, right? Um, put a piece of glass, Bob puts the same piece of glass, nothing happens. What if I just assume that whatever they can do is isomorphic? Like, there's a class of pieces of glass that Alice can do and like isomorphic pieces of glass that Bob can do, but they don't talk to each other, perhaps. Um, so the groups are not identical, but isomorphic, and then you see that d equal to 5 is also a possibility, and that was exactly quaternionic quantum mechanics. So you can come up with a theorem where you say here are three assumptions. One is that the beam splitter can prepare any of these probabilities to be up or down. The second, um, if you have two pure states with the same probability, you can always move from one to the other just by local operations. And then you say whatever A and B can do are isomorphic. So the second somehow says, for example, that you don't have any degrees of freedoms of the ball sitting here without talking to you. That could always be a seven ball and four of the degrees of freedom do nothing. So you exclude this here. Turns out that this still allows every dimension, but now you assume relativity of simultaneity and then you get only the cases one, two, three, and five, right, as the Bach ball dimensions. Let me not read this, but just the conclusion is that relativity of simultaneity singles out the associative division algebras from these infinitely many possible um, state spaces. And this is somewhat suggestive. You see that somehow in order for a probabilistic theory to talk to space-time in a way that we wanted to have some certain simple properties to hold, this can be very constraining. Now what can we do with this? Um, so this is now a recent project in the last part that I talk about with all my group that I've been working on like the last year or so, um, which is on kind of spin-bounded correlations. So, so this is the idea. So somehow, um, there are other arguments too that say that somehow quantum theory seems to be tailor-made to fit into space and time in a way that no other probabilistic theory fits. Can we show or analyze this more explicitly? And one way to do it is to look at metrological games or metrological scenarios and ask whether quantum theory is optimal for games that you can play in this context. So here's a scenario where the goal is somehow you, you have a rotation that's performed, maybe a referee performs that rotation to your system by an angle alpha around a fixed axis. Yeah. And you want to learn something about alpha by measuring the system that's, that, that senses it. Right? So if you think of like a, a preparation device, like, like a single photon source, and you rotate it, the statistics will change. You can learn something about the angle and the change of statistics. Or maybe your particle passes this region. Um, it senses what's going on here, like in metrology, and then you want to do a measurement and estimate some parameter. Good. Um, certainly, if this is if you send a classical gyroscope, yeah, then this is trivial. You can just read off the angle. Right? So it becomes interesting. Your system is small in some sense. Right? So let's, for to make it interesting, let's make an assumption about how small the system is and how well it responds to rotations. Let's assume that its spin is bounded. For example, it's a particle at most spin j. A classical physics system like a gyroscope would correspond to a j equal to infinity system. Uh, that, that would then allow you to read off the angle exactly, but what if the angle is small? Also, let's suppose we're asking only binary questions, like yes, no questions. So your outcome is always minus one or plus one. Um, so you can say, well, if I assume that quantum theory holds, then this gives me a bunch of correlations or probabilities that are consistent with spin J quantum theory, and I call them quantum spin J correlations. You say, well, um, wh what is that? Well, I have a probability of getting plus one or, or probably of, of outcome B, given that I had rotation angle alpha, which, which is given by the Born rule, right? 
So what's the Born rule? You have your measurement operators you know, that, that tell you what the measurement is. You have your initial state, and the rotation acts now on the state. Right? So what is this? Where the rotations act on the state, we are unitaries. So you have a unitary representation of the rotation group. Okay. Um, it's not SO3, it's SO2, so it's actually a bit simpler. But you would say if the spin is at most J, then you can write it in that form. You can basically diagonalize it, and you get a bunch of complex exponentials. And whatever appears in the exponent is the, the, the factor is at most J. Right? Think of just ordinary SU2, but fixed to the z-axis. And they look like this, the transformations that you get. Uh, consequence, for example, is that your probability rule that you have is always a bunch of sines and cosines. Yeah? It's a trigonometric polynomial of degree at most 2j. So if you spin one half particle, then you might perhaps get dependence of outcome plus on the angle, like one half plus one half cosine alpha, or things like this. And you find lots of these equations when you look at actual experiments. Uh, lots of exper this is kind of very realistic in a way, when people rotate the polarizers in the Bell experiment and so on. Good, now what is a more general spin J correlation? Well, the idea is we just throw, so we take the probability rules and the fact that they are trigonometric polynomials of degree 2J, but we forget that they should come from the Born rule. Let's not assume this. Let's just say, well, these kind of quantum rotation boxes, now we have general rotation boxes, and these are probability rules, everything's probabilities between 0 and 1, but not from the Born rule. And you can show, indeed, that this can come just from representations acting on arbitrary state spaces, which are not quantum necessarily. Then you can get all of these as your probability rules, how your physical system could react. Good, so we can take them side by side, and certainly, quantum ones are inside the, the more general rotation box uh, correlations. Um, in our paper now, that's upcoming, we show that certainly for spin zero, <laughs> spin zero means it depends on, on the angle not at all. Yeah? These sets are the same. Um, for spin one half, they are also the same, which is kind of easy to show. And for spin one, they also agree. Yeah? But this is very difficult to show, in fact. So for spins 0, 1 half, and 1, um, quantum theory gives you already the most general correlations and is therefore optimal for all these metrological tasks. But not for spin 3 halves and higher. Yeah. It's interesting, right? because we think like, oh, the, the elementary particles that we know of all have spin 0, 1 half, and 1. But suppose, what about spin 3 halves? So here's something you can do. Here's a game that you can play. Yeah. It's not the most natural game, but something you can play. You know? So some referee draws an angle alpha between 0 and 2 pi at random. Not uniformly, but with a certain probability density, which looks like this, and it's plotted here. That's the probability density. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> um, and the goal is not to determine what the angle was, but whether it has been chosen from the red region or from the blue region. Okay? Essentially, red and blue mean where these cosine and sine terms are either positive or negative. Yeah. Turns out that when you have quantum spin three half systems, then they allow you to win this game with a probability of like 85%. But if you have more general spin three half systems, they would allow you to win this with a probability of about 88%. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, this tells you on the one hand that the quantum three-half spin set is a strict subset of the more general one. Um, also, you can say that this more general set is actually an outer SDP, semi-definite programming approximation to the quantum set. And so it allows you to get computationally efficient bounds on how a quantum system could behave. Here's where it comes from. So these probabilities all have this form with a bunch of sines and cosines. Turns out that if it's, if it's a quantum box, then these two coefficients, C2 and S3, their sum is always less than or equal to 1 over square root of 3. It's like a kind of Zittelson type bound. But you can write down an example polynomial that's also of that degree and that is between 0 and 1, and that violates it because it gives you a higher value. OK, um, I'm running out of time anyway, so let me stop here. So this is what I've shown you, a bunch of stuff on quantum reference frames and dimensionality of the qubit. Um, showing you that quantum theory is optimal in metrological games for spins 0, 1 half, and 1, but not for 3 halves and higher. Um, 
Now, let me just finally mention the motivation for doing this. Why are we interested in this? Well, um, one motivation is indeed, um, and Stefan will talk about this in the next talk, that you can use some of this um, to come up with new semi-device independent protocols, for example, to generate random numbers. Because instead of assuming a dimensionality of a quantum system, you can perhaps assume something about the spin, which is maybe physically more motivated. Uh, for me, the main motivation is really foundational. And perhaps to make a very small and modest step or collect a few modest insights for quantum gravity, which is all about the interplay of quantum theory and space-time physics. Um, so how, how do the structures play together of these two parts of physics, of probabilities and space-time? Also, you can say this is something like studying correlations that are resource-bounded. And the paradigmatic example that you typically look at would be quantum speed limits, where you bound the energy and say, how quickly can a state evolve to an orthogonal state? And this is kind of a more general view where you study correlations with respect to physical resource bounds. There's also some nice mathematical physics for those of you who like this, related to orbitopes, SDPs, and harmonic analysis, and so on. Good, so, so here are the papers um, on the archive, if you're interested. And yeah, I'll stop here. Thanks. <laughs>